We were doing the uh, personal incidents in the life of the Rasulullah, especially in his married life. So we understand, I told this last week, the wives of the Rasulullah were predominantly in two camps. You had Hafsa and Aisha and Safiya in one camp, and you had Zainab bint Jahash and Umm Salama in another camp. Zainab bint Jahash was known for her uh, charity. She used to give a lot of charity, but she was also known for her anger. Okay. So once Rasulullah was sitting with Sahaba, guests, guests sitting in his house, and there's a partition, and Aisha is making food in the kitchen. Zainab bin Jahash, realizing that there's Sahaba guests sitting in the house, and Aisha is cooking, it's her day, it's her house, she decides to cook some food in her house and send it over to the Rasulullah. The food is then given to Aisha. And as soon as she sees that this food has been made by Zainab bint Jahash on my day in my house, I'm the one who's supposed to be making the food for the Rasulullah. And she's sending this food behind the curtain. Remember, this is happening behind the curtain. She takes the plate and smashes it in anger. And she breaks the plate completely. You cannot save the plate anymore. It's broken, shattered. And the food is on the floor. I want you to think for a second. Our wife is cooking food. We are not living in a state of poverty. We have enough wealth. Alhamdulillah, we have been blessed. And our friends are sitting. And our wife does this kind of behavior in the presence of our friends. What will be our reaction in the presence of friends? And what will be our reaction when the friends leave? Remember your reaction. Anyway. So Rasulullah Sallam hears the smashing. He understood what happened. The Sahaba are like, what happened? And so the Prophet just says this. Your mother has been overcome by ghira. Your mother has been overcome by positive jealousy. And then the Sahaba, when they eventually leave after they're done eating, the Prophet Muhammad goes to the kitchen or whatever section that was. He himself gets down, picks up the food, the portion of the food that he can save. You know what? There's a, the portion that is on the floor is gone, but whatever portion he can salvage, he picks up that portion of the food and puts in the plate of Aisha that on and just says this to Aisha. Don't forget to give this plate to Zainab. Because you broke her plate. Right? So don't forget to give the plate to Zainab. That's it. Can you believe what I just said? Can you believe my reaction, your reaction right now? Do you know who was sitting? Can you believe the reaction? And you, if you were thinking, okay, this is in the presence of people. He does not want to make a scene. Well, he didn't make a scene after they've left. When he has all the right to ask what happened. At least he could have said, what happened? That's it. There's nothing to ask for. It's a matter of personal ghira. A lot for us to learn from this incident, right? Okay. Another incident is, so first, before I give you this incident, I'll tell you the background. We all know that the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam loved Aisha Dharana. Usually slightly more than the other wives. They used to feel like he is a little more favorable to them. I told you last week the incident of Hafsa Radilawan switching her Hawdaj with uh, Aisha. And then she eventually realized, what did I do? I know the Prophet would have come to me if I would not have switched. So other wives of the Rasulullah and the Sahaba used to feel like the Prophet Muhammad is a little more discounting or a little more inclined toward Aisha Radilawan. And so the other Sahaba, not the Rasulullah, the Prophet Muhammad used to do justice with his wives. But other Sahaba, when they had to gift something to the Rasulullah, they used to pick the day of Aisha Dharana to give him the gift. Is this Rasulullah's fault that the Sahaba are picking the day of Aisha and gifting her and gifting him? No. But you can imagine what our other mothers will feel. And so the rest of the wives of the Rasulullah then decided to do something about it. And so they go to Fatima, the beloved daughter of the Rasulullah, the one of the four women whose iman is perfected. Prophet Muhammad says these are the four women whose iman is perfected. He said that many are the men whose iman is perfected. That is the Prophet. There's so many Prophets who have been perfected. But in the women, these four. Number one, Maryam alayhi salam. Number two, Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun. Number three, the wife of the Rasulullah, Khadija Dharanha. And number four, Fatima, عنها, the daughter of the Rasulullah. These, their iman is perfected. So they say to Fatima, you go on our behalf to the Rasulullah and tell them that, you know, let's do justice or whatever. Fatima عنها, comes to the Rasulullah and says, Ya Rasulullah, the, well, your wives are complaining about justice. Now, 
pause here for a second and understand if somebody who has no idea about hadith, no idea about the context, no idea about the history, he just reads this. Ya Rasulullah, the wives are complaining about justice. And somebody presents this on YouTube or something. Look, complaining about justice, your prophet. Astaghfirullah. Understand the context. That's why it's important to know the background of the hadith when people just go literally and just understand. The justice she's referring to is other sahaba give gifts on the day of Aisha and the other wives don't like it. And so they are complaining to me that I should go to you and tell you that, you know, everybody should be gifted. Now, think from the perspective of the Rasulullah sallallahu Is he supposed to go to the Sahaba and say, guys, you should not be giving gifts or you should not pick Aisha or anything. It's up to the person what he wants to do, right? So we can understand the perspective of our mothers, but we also have to understand the perspective of the Sahaba and the Rasulullah. They choose who, I mean, they're doing everything that is halal. So. Fatima puts this complaint, so-called complaint, to the Rasulullah and the Prophet says, Do you love the one that I love? And he, she says, Yes, Ya Rasulullah, of course, my father. Then he says, Then love this lady, Aisha Dharana. He points to Aisha and says, Love this lady. If you love the one I love, then love this lady. So she accepts it. Okay, done. And she goes back to the other mothers and she says, This is what the Prophet said. End of story. But our other mothers did not find it satisfying enough. They, they were not satiated by this. So they were like, you did not try hard enough. Okay, plan B. So they then go to Zainab bint Jahsh. Zainab bint Jahsh was the main competitor of Aisha Dharana in the other camp. When Aisha Dharana was asked, who did the Rasulullah love the most? She said, I never asked this question to the Rasulullah, but I always thought that after me, it was most likely Zainab bint Jahsh and Umm Salama. Those were the main competitors. So Zainab bint Jahash goes, and please understand, Zainab bint Jahash, she can get angry, and that was one of her things, that Aisha Dhanan herself said her anger was rather sudden, and so sometimes it has been to trouble. Okay, so she goes, and she picks a day when Aisha Dhanan was there in the house. So she goes to the house of Rasulullah, Aisha Dhanan's house, and she directly goes and talks. And she starts charging up, and she's saying that Aisha does this, and you are doing this, and this is this. And the Rasul is lying down and listening. Aisha then is standing in the kitchen and Zainab the Jahash is presenting the case. And the Rasul is listening to them and she's going and, and she's standing next to the Rasulullah Sassam. And Aisha Dharana is busy doing whatever she's doing and she's not liking this behavior and she's tolerating it. She's waiting to her for her to finish. So as Zainab the Jahash keeps going and she's this and she's doing this and you're doing this, she's looking at it, getting angry and she looks at the Rasulullah Sassam. As if she's asking permission, do I, can I talk back? And she's describing this. And she's describing in her older age. You see, Zainab bin the Jahash will be the first wife to pass away after the death of Rasulullah Sassim. The Prophet was asked, who's the one who's going to follow you, Rasulullah? He said, the one with the longest arm, the one with the most charity. And that was Zainab bin the Jahash. Uh, anyway, so Aisha the Ra'unha is getting angry and she's looking at the Rasulullah, can I talk back? Because this is getting out of hand. And so he gives the ishara, yeah, you can speak. I mean, the wives are speaking to each other. That's fine, you can speak. So now Aisha Dharana begins and she's very eloquent. She's the daughter of Abu Bakr Siddiq. And then she charges up and then she talks back. And she says, this, as for this, this is this, as for this, whatever they had conversations about. To the point where Zainab bin Tajash, who was right now, like literally yelling in front of the Rasulullah Sallallahu Now she goes behind the Rasulullah Sallallahu for protection from Aisha. Like she's literally now be like, oh, that's too much. I did not know that's the reaction I'm going to get. And then she's looking now at the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Zainab the that defend me, say something. You know, she's not saying this, but she's now looking at like, look at what she's doing. So Rasulullah looks at her and says, Haza binta Siddiqa, she's the daughter of Siddiqa, you know, the eloquent Abu Bakr. She's the daughter of Abu Bakr. So her, her language style is like that. What can I do? But anyway, this was the, this was the back and forth that happened between our mothers. Zainab the Jahash goes back. Now the wives of the Rasulullah, they may go for plan C. What is plan C? Let us send the balanced one, Umm Salama radiallahu the, the wife that is known for being balanced. So Umm Salama goes to the Rasulullah after some time. When Umm Salama presents the case, Rasulullah Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam now says, don't bother me about Aisha anymore. For Wallahi, even Allah reveals revelation only in her house, in her bed. Like this is not just me. 
Even Allah is the one who's revealing only in, when I'm in her bed. And uh, the Sahaba, if they're doing what they're doing, they're doing. And so it is not fair for someone else to criticize A'udhu Billah or point fingers to Aisha that I don't have and she's not responsible if somebody loves her, somebody loves her. Like, why is, why is she being held responsible for anything? So that's the story. Hargira with the Rasulullah. I guess there are a couple of stories about that. We can talk about that. Once Aisha Dharana was sleeping, it was the middle of the night. Again, there's no lamp, there's no light or anything. In the middle of her sleep, she sees that also is not there. So in the middle of the night, she immediately puts her hand out and then she feels the feet of the Rasulullah in sajda. And she goes, oh, okay. When the Prophet Muhammad brings the prayer, said, what happened? She says, Ya Rasulullah, forgive me. Where is your mind and where is my mind? <laughs> I'm thinking you've gone left me. Gone to some other wife or something, astaghfirullah, and you are just busy thinking of Allah. So, again, this is the story of when she has a ghira for other wives, right? For the Rasulullah. Once Aisha Dharana crossed a line in which, in this rare event, Rasulullah is going to be upset. So, what is the crossing of the line that happened? So, very close to the passing away of the Rasulullah, very close to the death of the Rasulullah, a few days before that. Allah sent Jibra'il al -Islam down in the middle of the night after Isha when people used to sleep after Isha there's no lights and said and Ya Rasulullah Allah has asked you right now to go to Baqi al Gharqat and do dua for the Shaheed of Uhud the Sahaba who were Shaheed in Uhud mountain of by the way this is a blessing for those Sahaba who were Shaheed in Uhud inshallah one day we'll do Uhud so in the middle of the night he has been asked wake up go and do dua for the Sahaba in Uhud now again for us to learn what a gentleman, our Rasulullah The Prophet Muhammad does not want to wake up Aisha Dharana. So he quietly gets up from the bed, walks over to the door, puts on his hulla, and quietly closes the door enough to not make any sound. But he's being so careful that Aisha Dharana wakes up. Now why is he being so careful? <laughs> But I just want to pause here and think for a second. Imagine if your boss just calls you. Not Allah, not Jibra'il. Your boss just calls you and said, a million dollar deal, come to the office right now. What do you do? What do I do? We jump out of the bed. Oh, I gotta go. The wife will wake up. What, what happened? Nothing, I'll talk to you later. Right? This is a million dollar deal. Allah said, go and pray and do dua for the Shaheed of Uhud. And he's waking up like, okay, just. Allah is the one calling, but give me a second. Let me just quietly wake up. This is the Rasulullah Sallallahu what do we learn from this? These incidents would not have been of any importance if it were not for us to learn from it, to be a husband. Anyway, so he goes and he puts on his hullah, he's about to leave. Aisha Dharana, this is the example of when she crosses the line. So she's thinking, where is he going? And so she decides to put on a scarf and follow the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi The Prophet Muhammad goes to Baqi al-Gharqat. He does the dua. Aisha Dharana is following a person in a scarf. Now when you have in the middle of the night, after Isha, in the graveyard, where people will normally not frequent, you have a shadowy figure behind the Rasulullah So when the Prophet is done with the, salah, with the dua, as he turns back and he's coming back to his house, he now sees a shadowy figure. And she realizes, oh my God, he's coming back. So she immediately turns back. Now she starts walking back to her house before the Rasulullah can get there. But then the Prophet Muhammad also starts walking back check to check to see who is this not realizing this is <laughs> our mother so then she's describing this so then I started to walk briskly fast and so the Rasulullah then started following me briskly so then I started to prance and so the Rasulullah then started to prance and so then I started to run and the Rasulullah then started to run and then finally I made it to my house and I jumped in my bed pretending that I'm sleeping but even if you do this you will get caught how? You've been running. What do you think happens? You're going to be huffing and puffing. So she's, <sighs> and she's doing this in the bed. And the Rasulullah just arrives in, the, in, in his house. And he sees Aisha Dharana going, <laughs> he's, she's huffing and puffing. He says, was it you? You were the one who was following me this entire time? So initially she's like, what, following who, what figure and everything. But then she says, I'm sorry, Rasulullah, I, my ghira got the better of me. This is a moment where she crossed the line. And so also some then, at, at that time, in that culture, they used to, to draw attention, they used to pat on the chest. Today we pat on the back, right? So at that time, they used to pat here. So then he's patting, and Aisha Dharana, kind of like a 
questioning and also warning Aisha at the same time that did you really think that I would do something like this? Did you really think that Allah and Allah's Rasul would do something to you like this? Because when it is the night of the wife, it's the night of the wife. You don't go to somebody else, so, so another wife on that night. That is the haq of the wife. Did you really think that Rasulullah would do this to you? And so she obviously was asked to not do this. So that is the incident where, again, Lira, she is in love with the Rasulullah, and so sometimes she crosses the line. Some of the other wives of the Rasulullah. Also. So when the Prophet Muhammad was married, Safiya Dalanha, Safiya Dalanha, remember, was extremely beautiful. When the Rasulullah was married, Safiya Dalanha, Aisha Dalanha had heard about the beauty of Safiya. So she herself wanted to go and see how she looked. <laughs> so one day she dressed up, covered up herself completely. The eyes are not covered, she can see, everything else is covered. And as the Rasulullah is coming into Medina with his new wife, she's also standing there and looking to see. She just wanted to get a glimpse of how she looks. And of all the women that you can see, you can spot your wife, even if she's covered, right? Like if you're in Saudi and you're waiting for your wife to come from the masjid, and there are like so many women in the abaya, and you can see your wife walking. That's just something that Allah has given us this power, right? If you are in a society where they wear abaya, you can spot your wife walking. So so some sees Aisha that I'm, <laughs> and she's thinking I'm all covered. Nobody knows that I'm standing here. <laughs> After the Sosim goes home, he says, so what did you think of her, of Sophia? Now she's like, what? She's like, yeah, you were there, right? So what did you think of her? And now she wants to downplay it. So she says, oh, I just saw a Yahudiya. Oh, just a Jewish lady, that's all. <laughs> but she was actually, she was really beautiful. And so she actually used to say that. In fact, when Umm Salama was married to the Rasulullah Sosim, Umm Salama was also very beautiful. Remember, she got a lot of proposals from even Umar and Abu Bakr Siddiq and everybody. Hafsa Dala went to see Umm Salama. And she said, yeah, she's really beautiful. Again, Hafsa and Aisha Dala were friends. So she came back home and said to Aisha Dala, Umm Salama is beautiful. So now Aisha Dala has to see how beautiful she is. So she goes to see Umm Salama for some reason. And she goes and she sees that Umm Salama is really beautiful. She comes back to Hafsa. She says, you said that Umm Salama is really beautiful. She, she says, yeah. Why did you not tell me that she's extremely beautiful? You just said she's very beautiful. She's way more beautiful than what you described. <laughs> and so Hafsa is saying, no, she's beautiful, but not that much. I mean, come on, you're exaggerating. She's like, no. And then after a couple of days, she went to see Umm Salama again for some other reason. And then she comes to Hafsa and says, yeah, you're right. My Gheera got the better of me. She is beautiful, but I just made her way too beautiful in my mind. Yeah, you're right. So that is Umm Salama. Juwaidiyah Remember Juwaidiyah Banu Mustariq. When Juwaidiyah was first, again, was first they were captured, right? They, they, um, if you remember the expedition, inshallah, we'll cover it one day. They had captured the entire tribe Banu Mustariq. Um, and so Juwaidiyah was part of the captives. When she was being uh, handed over to one of the Sahabi, she objected. Look at this. The captives were objecting. Look at the freedom in Islam. She goes to the Rasulullah and says, I am this and I am the daughter of the, the king of that tribe and I deserve better and this and that. And so Rasulullah has been looking at her and so he says, why don't you marry me? Okay, that'll be my gift to you. You can marry me, you're free and you'll be my wife. Now, before she was directed to the Rasulullah she had first gone to Aisha Dharana. And Aisha Dharana says, as soon as she walked to me, I hated her as soon as I saw her. <laughs> because, and she says this, because I knew that the Rasulullah will see in her what I'm seeing in her. And this is an important line for us to remember. This is in line for us. There is something that the Rasulullah is going to see in her that she is seeing in her. And she doesn't like that, but the Prophet likes it. That's how Allah has made us. So it's perfectly fine if you like somebody and you marry that person. That's, that's how you keep it halal. Something for us to learn. Anyway, so... Okay, I'll give you one more incident of Aghira, and then I'll come to Khadija, which is the line that was crossed. There was a big red line crossed. So when the Rasulullah was about to pass away, when he's on his deathbed, you know, even on his deathbed, he's joking with Aisha. So it just so happens when in the last uh, days of the Rasulullah's life, blessed life, Aisha also had a headache. She had a migraine headache going on at the same time when the Rasulullah is about to pass away. And so as she's taking care of the Rasulullah, she used to also keep holding her head because it was aching a lot. In one of those sequences, she just goes, the Rasulullah is lying down, and she goes, Oh, my head, I'm dying. You know, that's how you say it, I'm dying, my head. So the Rasulullah says, Oh, my head? 
Rather, you should say, I should say, oh, my head. I'm the one who is feeling sick, right? And then he says, and remember, he's trying to lighten up the mood because he's trying to introduce the topic of death with Aisha Dharana in a joking manner. He says, and what do you have to lose if you were the one who, who would die? For the one who would do ghusl on you would be the Rasulullah. I mean, what better death than to get the ghusl by the Rasulullah and the burial by Rasulullah and the janazah by the Rasulullah. Like, what are you complaining about? <laughs> so Rasulullah is saying, what would, what would you lose if you were to die? For Like, you would get the, the ghusl of the Rasulullah, janazah of the Rasulullah, dua of the Rasulullah. And look at where Aisha Dhan's mind goes. She goes, yeah, and you would like that. Because the day I die, the next day you'd be found in one of your other wives' house. <laughs> you see? You see? Her mind goes there when the Rasulullah was talking about burial in this. All of these things I'm telling you is it shows that it is fine for, because look at our generation now, it is fine for the women to have ghira and, and it's fine for you to be possessive and everything. But remember the line that was crossed last week we discussed? So long as you don't cross the line, this is fine, this is understandable and we have to be understanding of our wives. There was one incident where she crossed the line and that was when Aisha Dharana said something about Khadija. Now realize Khadija Dharana is from the Makki period she passed away in Mecca. The Prophet Muhammad married Aisha Dharana. This is in Madani stage. She has never seen Khadija Dharana, never. But she says herself that she was the most jealous of, of all the wives, she was the most jealous of Khadija Dharana. And she has never even seen her. And the other wives she's seen. Imagine how much the Prophet Muhammad used to love Khadija Dharana for her to feel like this. And for Khadija Dharana, what can we say? We can have a whole halaqa, inshallah, one day on the blessings of Khadija Dharana. Realize Allah Himself for Khadija Dharana. Allah Himself sent salam to Khadija Dharana. Her understanding of the deen was beyond, par excellence. Allah sent down salam to Khadija Dharana. Jibreel gave the salam. And just so you know, in Medina, the Sahaba, they did not know how to respond to Allah. You know, when. Some Sahaba used to say, Wa alaykum as salam ya Allah. as salam alaykum ya Allah. What does that mean? I'll say as salam alaykum to you. Peace be on you. Whose peace? The peace that Allah is going to send, right? How, how are you going to send something to Allah? <laughs> Allah is the one who gives peace. He is peace, right? So the Sahaba would say, as salam alaykum ya Allah. And Jazakallah khairan Allah. Like, what? Jazakallah khairan. Allah is the one who gives the jaza, the khair. And you're saying Jazakallah khairan Allah. So, the, then the Prophet Muhammad SAW explained the way you're supposed to thank Allah is at you know, This is how we are supposed to thank Allah. Notice when early Makki stage, when um, the Sahaba are not there in Medina, I mean, by, by Medina stage, a lot of Quran has been revealed and they know a lot about the fiqh and everything. But in such an early stage, the understanding that Khadija that Rana had, Allah has sent salam to you, O Khadija, Jibra Islam is saying. Um, and Khadija that Rana says, Allah is salam, and from Allah is salam. He is salam. Like what? She's not gonna say, Walikum as-salam, ya Allah. That's the first reaction we would say. Allah says salam to you, Walikum as-salam, Allah. What does that mean? Allah sends salam. So she says, Allah is salam, and from Allah is salam. Allah is the one who gives us peace, and He is peace. This is her understanding. You know, in the early stages of Khadija, in the, before the Prophet Muhammad SAW became a prophet, a few months before he became a prophet, he had started hearing salam from, from rocks and stones and the trees and everything. They had started giving salam to the Rasulullah and he was hearing these sounds. And he, didn't, he, not, he does not know he's going to be a prophet, the last prophet. And he doesn't realize what's happening. He doesn't understand. So he used to go to his wife and he used to say, I can hear things. I hear rocks and stones giving salam to me. And once he said that, I hear, I, I, I feel like a jinn, like some jinn or something, because they used to believe in jinns at the time as well. Uh, they are saying salam to me. And even in this stage, now remember, you're saying this to your wife. The wife's reaction could be, what is wrong with you, right? The wife's reaction could be, what are you talking about? Why do you have voices in your head? Go to a doctor or something, right? This is the reaction of a normal wife. And she says, it must be a good jinn because he's giving you salam. Because if it is shaitan, he's not going to give salam. So even in that, she's finding a positive and that's what you need in a positive wife, right? Somebody who can be there for your support. When finally Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed Iqra, Bismi Rabbika Allazi Khalaq in Ghar Hira. And the Rasulullah is walking back to his house. Ghar Hira, if you know today, back to the Rasulullah's house is about two hours away. Today with all of, all of the technology we have, it is still an hour, hour and a half away. 
for him to walk back and he comes and he's saying, Zamiluni, Zamiluni, cover me up, cover me up. Like he doesn't know what's happening to him. And she's the one who hugs him. And, he, and literally they say that his thighs were touching the thighs of the Khadija Rana and she's comforting him. And she's saying, and this is in Bukhari and other books as well. She says, nothing will happen to you. Everything will be fine with you because you have never done anything wrong for anybody. And you take care of the poor and you take care of the masakeen and you have never wronged anyone and you are truthful and kind. All of the characteristics that, that Rasulullah has, she's describing to Rasulullah that nothing is going to be wrong. But realize, for any other wife's perspective, it's going to be like, what is wrong with my husband? That will be the reaction normally for a wife. That he's hearing things, he's saying, cover me up, shivering, fever, sweating. He's going to the mountain on his own for meditating. What would a wife think? And realize Khadija Dharanha was extremely rich. That's how she had hired the Rasulullah before the Prophethood. She had been married twice and she had enough money. And the problem at that time was that the women, they would not be able to do business in the sense that we can do business and we can go and monitor the transactions. So she needed somebody who can take all of the goods, go to Palestine, do the business with a woman and buyer and bring back the goods and you take your profit, I'll take mine. The problem is how are you going to trust the person who's going there and he just lies, okay, this is, this is the amount of money that I made there. What if you took 70% of it and gave me 30% and you're supposed to be 50-50? The Prophet Muhammad was known as the Sadiq and Amin, the honest and the trustworthy, the, the truthful one. So she had hired the Rasulullah because he was known for his truthfulness and that's how she was able to use the services of the Rasulullah and a partner of the Rasulullah There was two people who were doing the business for Khadija Dharana. When it was time for Rasulullah to get his salary, this is before the Prophethood. Right? I'm just saying Rasulullah but this is at the time when he was Sadiq and Amin. So he comes back, it's time for him to get his salary and Khadija Dharana, his partner comes over and Khadija Dharana says, there's the money, where is your partner? Muhammad Sallallahu And he says, He's too shy to come and ask for his money. So he just sent me. When Khadija asked this, her sister was sitting Hala. And Hala is going to be relevant in the story, so I'm telling you. And Hala says, Wallahi, I've never seen anyone as much of a gentleman as this man, Sadiq al Muhammad also. Like, what a gentleman. He does not even want to come and ask for his own haq. Imagine here to, in India, Pakistan, let's say you're sitting in a rickshaw. As soon as you stop at your destination, you walk two steps further without paying him. Guess what he's going to say to you? <laughs> That's the first reaction he's going to do. He won't give you two seconds, right? I need my haq. And by the way, he's right. You're supposed to pay him before his sweat dries. That's true. But that's the respect somebody will give you. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm saying and giving an example of a rickshaw wala because those people would be like the, having the least access to justice usually in, in such a society, right? And even then he'd be like, hey, where's my money? Don't talk to me. Just pay me my money first, right? This is the reaction of anybody who needs his money. And the Rasul has gone to Palestine and come back and he needs his salary. His partner is saying, let's go. And he's like, that's okay. You can go and just ask for my money. So the level, I mean, the level of behavior at a time when women were treated like property. At a time when you know what's going on, the Jahiliyyah. And uh, this is how he behaves. So she, her, her sister, not Khadija, her sister is saying, Wallahi, I've never seen a man as much of a gentleman as this man. And something entered the heart of Khadija. This is how she fell in love with the Rasul. And so she, then she decided to send proposal to she sent the proposal of marriage to Rasulullah Sallallahu not the Prophet. Can you imagine in Pakistan if a girl sends a proposal for marriage? <laughs> what happens to her? So what kind of people are we? Whose sunnah are we following? We're following the sunnah of India, Kanyadan culture. You see? She is the one sending proposal for the marriage. And the Rasulullah obviously, he accepts and it is the most blessed marriage. Okay, coming back to what happened with her. This is Khadija Dharana. She is really rich at the time. And we've not done the Makki Sira, I understand. But when there was a boycott going on, so in the early stages, it was private da'wah in Makkah. You're not allowed to publicly uh, do the da'wah. Then it was da'wah to the people you trust, family and friends. Then open public da'wah. By this time, Bilal, and everybody is being tortured. And when the torture is going on now, eventually they get to the point where they're going to boycott the Sahaba and Banu Hashim completely. They're going to boycott anyone who accepts Islam. This is when Abu Talib has passed away. Abu Talib has passed away. Six weeks later, Khadija Dharana passes away. This year is called the year of sorrow. The Prophet Muhammad is in one of the books. It says the Prophet Muhammad did not smile for a year after the passing of Khadija Dharana.
the love that he had for Khadija. And again, this is sensitive, but if you marry today or any, in any generation, a girl who makes more money than you, who has more power than you, more izzah than you, the behavior of that person is not going to be one of, even though there are exceptions, but in general, the respect that she will have for you would not be the one, the kind of respect you're seeking. Because no matter what you do in the house, she's the one paying for everything, she's the one who has that money, not that as a Muslim is supposed to take the money from the wife, I'm just saying if she, with her own free will, is paying the money. And you say, I think we should paint the color of the wall black. And she goes, white. You go, no, you know what, let's do black. He said, no, we're not doing black, we're doing white, end of story. How do you feel being told that's how it's gonna be? The, the wife who has more money, more authority, more power, more ISIS in the society, the husband does not feel like he's able to superimpose his will, despite him being the leader. The Prophet Muhammad did not have money, remember? And when the boycott was going on and he has to do da'wah and send messages, this requires money, you have to spend money on camels and, and, and transport. Khadija said, I have all the money you need. You continue with your da'wah and I'm here. So she was not just an emotional support, she was also the financial support. She's now financially helping the Rasulullah And realize, a regular wife who is, let's say a wife who is not, not, who doesn't have a job, doesn't do anything, she just depends completely on her husband's income. And she's listening to the husband and everything, that's great. But wait till she has a million dollars and see if she behaves in the same way. That is truly a wife who is obedient and who really listens to you. There's a difference in the attitude and behavior. Khadija Zaranha was behaving the way she behaved after she has all the money in the world. And also someone is younger to her. And now boycott has started in Makki period and they have been all asked to leave. But Khadija Zaranha is not Banu Hashim. She does not have to be a part of the boycott. But she joins the Rasulullah as the wife, obviously. And she's suffering through this. Now realize, if you have all the money in the world and you are being asked to eat dry bread, when you have the money sitting in the bank account, think of that sacrifice. You see a poor man on the street, I don't want to diminish the pain that the poor people have, but imagine a poor man on the street eating dry bread. Would you, would you think that's a huge sacrifice? Or a rich man with all the money in the world, but he cannot access his bank account, he's on the road eating dry bread. Both are eating the dry bread, I get it. But who do you feel injustice for? For the man who has all the money and he cannot access the money. But Khadija Zarana gave her money, she could not have food water, I mean, what they were, they were, there was a complete boycott. So Khadija Rana has supported the Rasulullah emotionally, financially, in, in every respect. And if you remember last week, what did we discuss? The rest of the wives of the Rasulullah have seen slight improvement in the quality of life after Khaybar, and they were all demanding a better lifestyle. And I'm not, I'm not trying to astaghfirullah put down our mothers, but I'm trying to explain that the maqam of Khadija Rana is unmatched. The maqam of Khadija Zarana is unmatched. Nobody comes close to comparison. Okay, so Allah sent down salam to Khadija directly. Okay, and then in the case of Aisha Zarana, Jibrail Islam has given salam to Aisha Zarana. So she also has an honor, that honor. But Allah sending salam directly is a higher maqam. Uh, some scholars say that in Wad Duha, when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Surah Wad Duha, where Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam got a revelation from Allah after six months when Allah has not been communicating and the people were making fun of him in the Makki period. What happened? You're not getting revelations anymore? What happened? Does your God not like you anymore? That's what they were mocking. Allah then sent down Wad Duha with Layli uh, Some scholars say that when Allah says that, did we not find you as an orphan and, and, and guide you and did we not give you the wealth? Did we not give you everything that you needed? Allah is talking about Khadija Zaranha because the wealth was given to him through Khadija. So Allah is saying, I gave you Khadija. Some scholars do this in the tafsir of Wad Duha. Okay, so now that you understand, of course I've done only a brief understanding of the love that Khadija Zaranha uh, used to have for the Rasulullah and vice versa. Once in Madani period, toward the end of the life of the Rasulullah, sister of Khadija Zaranha, Hala, is walking in her older age. Now this is the closest thing to Khadija that Aisha is going to see. Seeing Hala is going to be the closest thing to seeing Khadija for her. So before Hala is even coming, the Prophet Muhammad says, Allahum, Allahumma Hala. Oh Allah, it's Hala coming over. Now you can already imagine Aisha that has Ghira developing. Like just looking at Khadija, uh, looking at uh, Hala coming over, he is taken by this uh, 
sense of awe. And finally, Hala arrives. It was Hala. Aisha that I was looking at her. Agira is developing. She is boiling. <laughs> and this is the day when she's going to cross the line. So she's looking at the way that Rasulullah is paying attention to, uh, to her. Now, the Prophet Muhammad, whenever he used to talk to somebody, he used to talk to the Sahabi or Sahabiyya in a way that they used to think that the most important person for the Rasulullah in this world is me. That's how they used to think. You know, Amr ibn al As. Uh, he accepted Islam in the last batch. If you remember, Khalid ibn Walid, I told you, was the last person to accept Islam, to do Hijrah. And Amr ibn al-As also was in that batch. And Uthman ibn Talha. Amr ibn al-As, when he became a Muslim, and he is now with the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi he used to think the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu loves me the most. Like he has just become Muslim a couple of months ago, but because the Prophet used to talk with so much attention and respect and love and care, that he would think, like for example, um, if somebody called me from this side, the Prophet Sallallahu would not turn like this and, and listen to what the person has to say. He would not do this. He would turn his entire body and say, yes, what is it? The level of attention, the, the detail that he used to give to the person when he's talking to. So once Amr ibn As is sitting, everybody's sitting. And he says, Ya Rasulullah, who do you love the most? He says this to Rasulullah. And again, the Prophet, this is Madin period. The Prophet Muhammad says, Aisha. All men sitting. And he uses the name of his wife. Again, something for us to learn. Imagine all of our male friends are sitting. Who do you love the most? And you say the name of your wife. We are ashamed to say that we love our wife the most. This is the culture. Astaghfirullah. Again, for us to learn from this. All men sitting in here. And he said, who do you love the most? And he's saying, Aisha. So then he says, Ya Rasulullah, I did not mean that way. Not the women. I just meant amongst us. And he then says, Aisha's father. So understand what he just did. He did not say Abu Bakr. He said her father. Because it seems as if speaking, saying the name of my wife in this gathering of males sounds icky. He says, yes, yes, I do not mean that way. I mean amongst us. So he says the same name again, Aisha's father. Okay, there's no problem at all saying that you love your wife in front of all the male crowd. So then he says, okay, after that who? He was thinking his name is next. He says, after that who? <laughs> the Prophet says, Umar. <laughs> after that, who? And then he goes, Uthman. And who? After that, Talha, Zubair. I don't remember the sequence, but he then continues, and the Prophet keeps giving him the name after name after name until he says, Then I stopped asking the Rasulullah because I was afraid that my name would be the last one to be spoken to. <laughs> I thought I'd be the last name on the list. So I just crouched. I just did not ask anymore. I just cringed. So this is how the people thought that when he's speaking to somebody, they used to think, he, You love me more than anyone in the world. So imagine when it is Hala coming over, who the Prophet actually used to send gifts all the time. So much that Aisha Dana used to get angry that is there no one else alive except for the family of Khadija? Whenever you get a gift, give it to the friends of Khadija. Oh, Khadija used to li like those people, send it to them. Khadija used to like these people, send it to them. That's all you keep doing. That's why she's complaining. And the Prophet Muhammad would say nothing. Now the sister herself has arrived. So the Prophet Muhammad talks to her and gives her gifts and everything and now when Hala leaves and she has just seen how the Prophet Muhammad is in his behavior with Hala all of the memories of Khadija that she has had up until now she takes it out and I'm not going to repeat the words that she said but she did not use the best of words to describe Khadija okay and again we are thinking you and I we are thinking from the perspective of a Sahabi and for us, we understand this would be blasphemy. And how can somebody talk like this about Khadija? I understand, but she, we are not the wives. We are not female. And we don't understand the ghira of the co-wives. So they have a discount that we cannot imagine. So she says, how long are you going to remember this lady? This old hag. How long are you going to remember her? With cheeks falling down, drooping. Because he's, she's thinking of her being old when she must have passed. How long are you going to listen to this? And the Prophet is just walking, not saying anything. Then she crosses the line. She says, and even then when Allah has given you something so much better, and he has more wives now. But what does she say? When Allah has given you something so much better, to this, the Prophet now turns. And now Aisha herself is describing this. She herself is describing this. Which shows that, look at how she's matured over the years. In her older age, she's the one telling this. Otherwise, you would never know. That this is what happened. And by the way, in this story, she's the one who's going to be reprimanded. And she is telling herself this story, which shows how amazing our mother is. Aisha Dharana. 
Now the Prophet does not like this, what she said. And the Prophet's face turns red. And in very few incidents in the seerah, the Prophet's face has turned red. And this is one of those occasions. And the Prophet says, La wallahi, Allah has not replaced her with someone better. Because she said, and Allah has given you so much better now. He says, now she connected Khadija with Allah. And remember, Khadija got directly salam from Allah. And even Aisha is a distant second, a distant second because she got salam from Jibrail. It's not the same thing as getting from Allah. So when she says, when Allah has given you so much better now, why do you keep remembering that lady? He says, La wallahi, Allah has not replaced her with someone better. She believed in me when nobody believed in me. She affirmed me as the Rasulullah when nobody would affirm me. She gave me money when nobody would share their wealth. And she gave me children when no other wife has been able to give me children. Except for Maria Khiptia who is not a wife, she was Malkini. These four blessings sum it all up. And after this, even Aisha Adrana says, after that, I promised I'm never going to talk about Khadija again. Her maqam is on another level. And so this is the line that was crossed, that she, that she did. One more. Safiya Adrana who was a Yahudiya, remember? And then she became Muslim. She was uh, in Khaybar. Once, when she was with Hafsa, عنها, Hafsa said something that hurt her. She said something like, oh, you are a Yahudiya. Now by race, she is. Ethnically, she is Yahudiya. It's just that she's Muslim now, right? And I guess, so she said that in a derogatory manner, that oh, you are just a Yahudiya or something like this. So, Safiya Dalauna was flowery you know she would cry she would be that kind of personality and so she started crying when the Rasulullah comes in and he sees her crying he says what happened and so Safiya Dhan says that's what Hafsa said that I'm a Yahudiya and look at what the Prophet says Rasulullah says and what does she have over you Hafsa what does Hafsa have over you for why don't you go and tell her that your husband is a Nabi and your father is a Nabi and your uncle is a Nabi. What is he saying? In her case, her husband is a Nabi. Hafsa Dalam's husband is Rasul Sazam. But in your case, a Yahudiya, who are the Jews, the chosen people of Allah, her father, Musa is a Nabi, Harun is a Nabi, the brother, uncle, and your husband is a Nabi, Rasul Sazam. So what, what, what is it that she's saying, oh, you are a Yahudiya? That's like saying, oh, you are just an A grader in school. Like, how's that an insult? Yes, I'm an A grader, that's awesome. And imagine a person who has a B saying this. Oh, you're just an A grade. Like, what? That's a good thing. Why, why are you uh, sad about this? Why are you crying about this? So the Prophet says, what does she have over you? Well, why don't you go and tell her? Your father is a Nabi. Your uncle is a Nabi. And your husband is a Nabi. Listening to this, Sophia Dharana obviously wipes her tears. And she's very happy now at this. So this is the incident where you can see the wives going back and forth. This was Hafsa Dharana's thing. Aisha Dharana once, she said this. And again, this is for us to learn. Once in front of Rasulullah SAW, not in front of Safiya, in front of the Rasulullah SAW, she said, oh, she's, remember, Aisha Dharana was taller and Safiya Dharana was not too tall, okay? And only a taller person can, I guess, make fun of a person who's not as tall. Not that it's halal, but only that person can say something like that. So she says in front of Rasulullah SAW that, oh, she's not that tall, something like that. So the Prophet Muhammad says, Ya Aisha, this one thing that you just said, that, you know, she's not that tall. This one thing is so, so dirty that if this one thing alone were to be put in the water, all the oceans of the, of the world would be polluted. All she said, she did not say Astaghfirullah, a cuss word. She did not say anything other than, ah, she's not that tall. That's it. Imagine what we say to each other. She just said, ah, you know, shorty. That's it. Yeah, Aisha, this one thing that he just said is so dirty that if this thing, what he just said, alone were to be dipped in water, all the oceans of the world would be polluted. That's how dirty this one thing is. Imagine. Imagine when we make fun of people. How they look, how... Because when we make fun of somebody who, the way he looks or she looks, that means we're making fun of Allah. Because you didn't have any contribution in the way you look. <laughs> Whatever happened was happened because of your parents. And they are, if they are good looking, it's because their parents were good looking. And it keeps going on. So Allah, 
if decided to make somebody look not really pretty, and you say oh, you're not pretty, that means you're saying Allah has not made, made you pretty. So this is such a horrible thing to say that entire oceans of the world would be dirty if you just put this one line in, in, the, in the water. Anyway, so those are some of the incidents that happened between our mothers. Uh, hopefully we'll have something to learn from this, the way to behave with our wives. The Prophet lived like a gentleman. Inshallah, we'll meet next week. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.